Good evening. Good evening all. Thank you for joining me again on one of my Monday night business conversations. For anybody that hasn't seen one of these, effectively they're recordings, but they're recorded as if they were live. We, the mistakes and all are kept in. So what you're seeing is what you get as far as these recordings are concerned. And the idea of them is that I take an opportunity to speak to some of the people in business that I find particularly impressive, people that inspire me, people that engage me, the type of people that when you walk into the room and they're there, you're really pleased to see them because you know they're good guys or gals. And when you go over and say hello, they'll be welcoming and friendly and enthused and, and glad to see you. And that is definitely the case with the young man we have with us this evening. Um, and I'm going to start off very simply by asking Peter to introduce himself to us. Well, Martin, I tell you what, I was waiting for you to say that whoever it was you had lined up had not actually shown up. So that's a, a really nice um, in, introduction. Um, yeah, I, I really appreciate um, getting the opportunity to um, speak to you today. Uh, I'm Peter Doak, and I run a little business in Belfast called PDG Advertising. Um, we've done, we've been in business for about five years or so now, and we, um, you know, I, I think we really look at how to connect people and technology um, up, and, and that, that's the business side of it. Who, who I am is a little bit uh, different than that. I'm, you know, I'm a global traveler, gone all over the world, plan to go all over the world again whenever you know this lockdown is is over um I love working with other cultures and other countries and and things like that I love working at home here in Belfast and Northern Ireland and Ireland and the UK it's really really amazing um love new technology I think this as a medium you know us being able to talk here and now like this um is really amazing so yeah I, I think that's that's a bit about what I'm about it's amazing it's amazing that you've reached the five mile, five, five year milestone in business. I can remember when Michelle and I reached five, year, five years with Gilchrist and Co. We held a celebratory party down in Farset Labs and we had, we had a lot of fun. Now, by the time we'd reached five years, our business had developed in a way that we probably hadn't expected it to when we initially launched it. Is your business where you thought it would be after five years? Is it different from what you thought it would be? And, and what surprised you about where you are now, if anything, um, between what your business was in your mind before you started and where you are now? It's, it's such a great question. So when I think back to how I started this business, um, I started it in my car, in the back room of, in my in my bedroom, you know, anywhere where I could get a Wi-Fi connection, you know, like coffee houses, places like that, places on the on the go. Um, and then a year later, I was able to secure a hot desk in a co-working space in East Belfast, the city east um, building, um, in the foundry. Um, and then I was able to get a a little one-person office, and then I was able to get a little two-person office whenever um, we. Uh, employed, uh, started to employ people. And um, then we graduated up, graduated up to a three person office and we're now just working on a lease for a much bigger office um, now. And, and that's across the course of, of five years. And in a lot of ways, it feels like a 20 year journey. In a lot of ways, it feels like, you know, just a week or so. Um, there's, there's so many ups and downs. And did I think we would have got here this quick? Did I think we would have it would have taken as long to get here. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. What I've kind of been able to get at peace with is um, trying to enjoy the journey as you know it's going through and trying to monitor and take a look at you know what we're experiencing in the moment um, rather than looking too far ahead or, or looking back at some of the things that have happened. But I suppose if I look really objectively at it, like five years is a really short time to have taken something from absolutely nothing. Uh, to where we are to where we are now so yeah I, I think that's 
I think that's um, been our, our, our journey. Um, how about your journey? How about, you know, that journey up to the five year mark whenever you um, did that? Did it feel long or did it, was it short? The whole thing, we're, we're, we're now in business nearly 14 years and it has just grown wow. like that. Yeah. The thing was when, when I started in business, so I'm, I'm just turned 36. So it was about 33, or sorry, 46. Oh, she was 36. <laughs> Freudian slip. Um, so I've just turned 46. So it was about, I was about um, 32. I, I, actually, I was younger when, when I started a consultancy, my own consultancy before Michelle and I joined for Gilchrist and Co. Um, when I was about 28. And I re remember going along to things like bar camps and biz camps and all this. And there was a lot of exciting things starting to happen in Belfast as social media started to take off. And I go to things now, or I did before the lockdown, and I feel like the same person inside. You know, I still feel like I'm that 28 year old full of vim and creativity and excitement and ambition and all that type of stuff. And then you look at the people out there and they all look really, really young. Are you sitting going, are they looking at me now going, who the hell's this old fella? That's that's turned off at our young person's event. So um yeah, it, it goes in. Don't, don't interrupt, but isn't that really isn't that really important for anybody that is starting off and, and feels like they need to rush things really fast that you know in, in a few years or so, you'll feel exactly the same as you did whenever you're walking into these, yeah. these things. It is, it is amazing. And it's amazing how quickly the time goes in. I think if you were to use an analogy, and uh, this is an analogy that I think fits incredibly well with business, starting a business is like having a child, you know, and sometimes the development seems really, really slow. So when your baby's one, from one to two, seems like for ages when you're in it, because you're changing nappies and you're you can't go out without taking a whole plethora of stuff with you and you need to get babysitters and there's a whole rigmarole and then two to four seems long as well because of starting nursery school and all the rest but see when you look back and you're like my son's now 19 he's at university the whole thing just seems like a blip it just it just yeah. goes in so quickly because you have to work through certain stages as, as the development of the business happens and you move on to the next level and each one's a little bit different. So even if you're doing the same business as, as, as we effectively have at Gilchrist & Co for uh, 14 years, it's constantly changing. Yeah. But it's changing like in the same way that a tree grows. If you plant a seed in the ground, you can't see it growing. But all of a sudden you notice, you know, you've got a shrub and then you've got a small bush and then before you know, boom, you've got all these branches and connections on the rest. So, yeah, it's um, it's been quite a journey, and one I wouldn't change a bit of. Thank goodness, thank goodness. I, I I love that because it's so important with goodness with customers and with uh, team team members and with creating that nurturing environment for people. Th there's no um, fast forward button. You can't go from you know the child being uh, one month to yeah. being. Eighteen. There's so many different steps, and you must you must go through them, and you'll be better on the other side of it. And you, you have to you have to take your time, and you have to kind of look and monitor what's happening in order to be better as you're as you're going forward. And yeah. so many times I've tried to skip ahead, or I've seen other people try to skip ahead, and I don't know whether it's a little bit of age, but you know you can take that step back and say, actually, what what's happening here? What, is this is this good or is this not good? That's actually you know you make a very good point about the fact you can't. Can, can you rush it? Can you can you say no? I don't want to do the two year bit or the four year old because I, I don't want to have one of those cranky teething type children or I don't want to do the changing nappy bit. I just want to get the the kick and football bit and then I want to stop it there. Can yeah. can you really do that? If we're using that analogy with a business, I I don't think, I think you maybe you're right. I think there is a process that you have to work through to grow a business and to really I think particularly with. And maybe I, I'm, not, I'm not sure because I, I don't make products, but certainly with a professional services business where your clients are relying on you to be the knowledgeable go-to person that they can ring for advice about all sorts of different things, yeah. you know. And we had a call today about um, should I continue with the um, with the job support scheme when there's a potential for me to take on work. Now that's not that's not a numbers. Well, yes, there's numbers involved in it, but it, it's there's a lot more to it than, than simply sure. the accounts in the background. 
And to be able to give advice like that off the top of your head or from, from your resource, you have to have a lot of experience. You have to have and gone through. as different... well that you've built up, you know, your instinct that you, that you can sense what to do instinctively without having to nearly look up things. And then, but then the thing that popped into my head, Peter, because that was, that was that's a fantastic, and that's why I love these conversations, because things crop up that you would never have thought of. And then the thing that popped in my head when you were saying that was using the analogy of a kid, a business being a child again. What happens when you have two or three children? <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, what happens if your business splits into different areas and, and expands and you have staff? Does yeah. that change what you need to do and how careful you need to do and the steps that you go through? Maybe by the fourth child, you can be... <laughs> you let loose the reins a little bit. Let gas it. I'm sure in reality you do a bit, don't you? You know, yeah. I'm sure that I'm sure there is a certain amount of that. Not 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 totally, especially not if we're talking about raising your kids, but um I, I guess you probably you'll probably do some some things a little bit better you'll have a little bit more confidence in the things that you're doing. So you'll not stress about some things as much, which will yes. potentially have a more positive effect on, on, on the business. I mean, I, I, in my head, I'm buzzing with, with new business ideas and things that I want to do all the time. I think like anybody that has any sort of uh, enjoyment in business or likes it, they're, they're kind of like that. There's lots of different ideas running about and I'm looking forward to getting to that point where I'm, um, you know, creating new businesses and, and doing things things like that. But again, I'm not going to rush that. I've got to take a little bit of time and enjoy what's happening right now because I've got a feeling that this period of my business is going to be one of the most enjoyable ones um, because later on there'll probably be a lot more stress and a lot more, you know, stuff to, to worry about. But, but right now... And on it's that awesome. point, while you're, while you're... I think this brings us on nicely to the next question, Javier. What is the business of PDG all about? What, what, what is your business and what, what does it do and where's it going and well what's important about it from your your perspective yeah it's 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 my absolute uh passion so i got involved in social media pretty early in a wonderful business um big outsourcing business in belfast and um it's just there, and this was maybe about 10 years ago or so, and I, I learned that I was able to put together uh, technology and show people how to use it in a fairly simple way. Um, to decomplexify technology, if that's in any way the right term. And what I then, the start of that was then got me thinking, well, I've always known that I wanted to go into business and for myself, and um, that was the idea. I just figured out something that I really, enjoyed and, and liked doing. So I started to really immerse myself in the digital world, like the internet, computers, Google, Facebook, Twitter, all of those amazing things. And I found that I was able to navigate. Which is them. best? Which is best out of all those amazing things? Facebook, Google. Um, I think Google is the most amazing to me right now. You know, if, if Google, if, if you ever were going to have an Android in the future, and their, their system is called Android. If you're ever going to have a, a robotic assistant in the future, then it's, I would imagine it has to be created by Google because we're all collectively feeding it with what we want all the time, every time, whenever we Google something. So that to me is completely amazing. It's almost too much to comprehend. Um, mm -hmm. But to understand that collective world of people looking at one thing and putting in all of their desires and all of their wants into it, it's just incredible. It's just absolutely um, mind blowing. And so how much does this scare you? And how much does it scare me? Yeah. How frightened are you of the power of Google or any of these platforms? Should we be terrified, a little concerned, or is the whole thing under control and with nothing to worry about? No, we, we should be very we should be very afraid. We should definitely be very <laughs> very yeah, scared. If I mean if you're if you're a sci-fi lover like me, if you if you love any of, of the the aliens or the you know um Oh, what's the one Stanley Kubrick where your guy goes off into the middle of, of nowhere? Uh, a space odyssey. 2001. Yeah, that, 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 those ones. If you even give like 5% of credence to that kind of kind of genre, then if that's where we're going, then we're all in a lot of trouble. So it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not okay. However, I'm an absolute believer in understanding things 
and getting to know them and getting to grips with them. So the more knowledge that I have, I mean, even, even little things like trying to build a little AI chatbot in Facebook or one on ManyChat or any of those platforms that you can build AI on for free, I think that that's a powerful thing because in the future, whenever we are all taken over by robots, um, <laughs> maybe there's some ability to, um, you know, understand it and navigate it a little bit uh, better. And aside from that being an extremely bleak uh, worldview, I think that's quite a bit ahead ahead yet. Yeah, we're, we're... more exciting than I do scary. I, I find it more amazing than I do scary. I think the possibilities are better um, than they ever will be due to robotics and automation and that. And I'd love to be a part of it. And it just excites me to no end to know that there are people, like you, you look at a couple of days ago, uh, if this is still relevant, the SpaceX um, uh, rocket going up into um, to leave the astronauts off at the International Space Station and the rocket coming down and landing perfectly on an automatic uh, AI um, boat ship that had pictures on it that everybody could see across the world. I mean, that's, I always find that the most incredible bit of the whole thing. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And it comes down poetically, like something, yeah. like a ballerina coming down. It's, it's amazing. And uh. that to me is just awe-inspiring uh, for, for sure. So I think in some way, PDG, what I want to do is I want to be the communication part of that. I want to be able to get a message across. And right now, that's manifesting itself in being able to get messages across from a, custom, from a business to their customer. And it's exciting and we enjoy it. We're building a small team of little expertise in my team members of Anthony and Nicole. Um, and we're building up our knowledge in all of these different little areas. And we're not perfect, we don't know everything, but we do have a real drive and focus on delivering that communication for our customers. We're learning all the time, it's very enjoyable. Yeah, and I don't think anybody knows everything. It doesn't matter how long you've been doing it and how much reading you do and how hard you work. Nobody knows everything. I think the most important thing is to have a genuine passion for trying your best to know the stuff that you need to know to provide the services that you're getting paid for. And yeah. if you don't know what you're doing or if you don't know that particular thing, that like you're completely honest with the client and say, look, I either don't know this, and I can go and find out and I will make it happen, or I don't know this and here's someone else that can do it for you. But yeah. there's nothing wrong with not knowing everything. It's being straightforward and honest with people and saying, being able to have that conversation to say, I either don't know it yet or it's not part of our um, not part of our portfolio. Just one question before we move off the, the, the technology thing, because I'm fascinated by this. I really do find your insights in this um, very interesting. Do you see anything in the immediate future and I, by that I mean the next five years that is going to fundamentally transfer and um, transform the way that you do business in the same way that maybe um, smartphones have transformed business because everybody can get their email from anywhere at any time or I can do my internet banking from my phone now or I can um, check if a bill has been paid using zero the zero app on my phone that was a fun, that's a fundamental change in the way we, we do business. Can you see something like that in the foreseeable horizon or is there is it, is stuff like that just unforeseeable? Yeah, th there are some things that I think are unforeseeable. There are major shifts that are unforese kind of unforeseeable. So there are themes that I feel run through um, our world and one of them is communication and people so there will always be in my mind a drive to make communication faster easier um, and, and what that means is technology has to speed up so if we look at maybe 50 years ago or I don't really know the timeline but uh, the telephone is is there and it's one level of communication but it's a lot better than the telegram, which is a, a postal note that's going. So that level of speed is one level up. And then there's another level up of email, perhaps. Uh, or maybe it's TV, or maybe it's something something like that. And there's Fax another machine. level up. Fax Fax machine. Machine. There's, there's so many little increments along, uh -huh. along the way that I see that, 
I mean, some of them are massive, but I'd, I'd say that there's like version 1.1.1.1 .1 of each of these um, systems that we use to communicate. Mm -hmm. But it seems to be that that's what we, as a species, focus on. So some of them are big, like TV and phones and, and that. And then comes along the internet, and it's just in, incredible. So in order to, and it's, it's rocket speed, it's faster than anything that you could possibly imagine, and is more connected to everybody than you can imagine. So the next level of that is <clears throat> how can we make that faster? So it's have the internet everywhere where, where you go. So it's the it's the mobile mobile phone. And I don't know it's foreseeable that I can foresee the the bigger event, but or the bigger thing or the bigger mode of using more connectivity and more communication with each other. But I do see that it's video. So we were having a conversation uh, a couple of days ago or yesterday um, about TikTok and yeah. how and how scary it is and how incredible it is but that along with snapchat and what was vine and the way instagram stories are being used that to me is the next evolution of how we're going to communicate we're not going to send messages we're going to send video messages over to people and it's facilitated by 5g um which will make it much easier and quicker to um do that whenever you're out and about even now on 4g when you're out it can be a little bit difficult to upload um, videos and that little bit of uh, lack of time in uploading a video can definitely stop you from wanting to do it. So whenever you don't have that barrier of time, you'll do it a lot more and people will do it a lot more and that will create a new generation of users of the internet and a new generation of ways of using the internet and we will have to understand it and ride that wave and, and understand how it goes. Just like the people Whack there who were using the telegrams had to figure out to use the mobile phones and had to use that. Um, I think that's the next um, level. Mm. And again, who knows? And do you have a strategy for how to how to do that? So there's new technology. We can see it. You believe it's going to become important. You already have an existing. I wouldn't call it by any means a traditional business, but it's it's an advertising business. It has a particular raison d'être. And yeah. you have to bring this new stuff into your business. Is there a way of doing that? Is there like, is there an academic structure that you can apply to this? Or is it a little bit of, you know, we're just going to start using it and see what happens. Or is it something in between two? It's a great, great question. Cause it's, it feels like it's, uh, there's an inherent fear of being left, left behind, you know, if I look at some traditional businesses that would have relied on newspaper advertising, to um, sell their business, um, that was completely wiped out by um, you know the internet coming on board, where everybody just Google's things now and they don't even need to get the the, the newspapers. So that completely changes the game. So if if we stick in one mode or we stick in one type of um, medium, whether that's uh, pictures or videos or messages, and we don't look at what's happening ahead and we don't try to stay reasonably um, current. Um, we will be left behind at some point because change happens all the time. It's constantly happening. And it also brings a little bit of excitement. It brings a little bit of challenge and it brings a little bit of buzz into it and it keeps us relevant and keeps us um, strong. Um, but the market ultimately decides that. So the market ultimately tells us whether or not an advert here is working or here is working. And then we'll look at the differentiators and say, oh right, that's happening now. And then this is happening now. There's a shift happening here. Uh, somewhere and there's many of them there's many of those little incremental things that happen and I think it's a mixture of everything that you said Martin because um, we do try to taste everything we try to do little bits of things and see how they work and then try to double down on the things that really really uh, really work well so we've had a good look at the future and how you're planning for that and where, where you see us going that, that's interesting I'm always interested about what's just over the horizon what's What's over the next hill, and uh, how it's going to make our lives better? Because I, I think I think you're like me. I think we're positive by nature. We're, we look sure. for, for the, the good things that are coming. I, I genuinely believe that even in the in the depths of a pandemic and with the scary things we're seeing happening in America at the moment, that things generally work themselves out and, and we move on to to a better place. But I wanted to, to go back into the past a little bit now for me and. Tell me about what have been some of the more important parts of your journey to get to where you are now. How did you get 
to the successful, interesting, good place you are with your business. Yeah, there, there's been a, anybody that runs a business, I think, for any length of time in, in any way, um, you know, I, I, I hasten to use the word success and successful because, you know, I'm always striving to do a lot, lot better, but anybody that does that finds that you have to work um, quite a lot. You have, to do, you have to do quite a few hours, you know, if you want to master your trade at, at what you're doing. So I, I think the first thing that kind of springs to mind is about the work ethic and showing up and putting in the hours and the, the hard work. And we've talked about this before, Martin, but, you know, um, before you do it, you don't really you don't really see the kind of work behind, you know, the businesses that you see um, out there. And whenever I now see businesses, I mean, my, my business is two employees, so it's on a really tiny, tiny micro micro scale. Whenever I look at businesses with 10 um, employees now, I think, wow, that's that's a real journey. There's a journey that's happened there. It has mm -hmm. been hard work to get to get to that um, to get to that point. Um, th there have been, you know, significant uh, milestones. Um, there have been uh, winning, you know, customers that we didn't think that we would ever be able to to win. There have having successes for customers and. You know, some of the customers that I've started with uh, five years ago are, are still with us uh, today. So that's quite incredible because in advertising, it can be a little bit choppy and changey, but we, we don't want that. We want to do a really great job for everybody that we possibly uh, can do. So having some successes with those customers and building the relationships is really important as, as well. Um, there are two customers that stand out that have been with us for a very long time, and they've come over here to Belfast to visit us. Um, I should say our customers are scattered all over the world. So the one that came from Iowa in America, um, he came and we uh, we went out in Belfast and it was just an amazing thing for to create a little business and for someone who we've been doing business with all the way over in Iowa, in Des Moines in Iowa, to fly over and uh, come and see us for the for the night. That, that was pretty, pretty incredible. And then even um, one of our customers from London coming over to see us. So I, I think one of the really important things is the relationships with people across time so building those up and discovering new people discovering you martin and discovering a lot of people on different networking groups and you know just uh learning from them and you know appreciating them and enjoying your time with them uh, that that those have been some real high points uh from the uh, from the journey what would you say and this is an unfair question because i'm just throwing it at you but what are if you had to pick three off the top of your head, what are the top three things that advertising is about? What, what, what are the three crucial elements of a good advertising campaign? Or does that differ depending on who you're working with and, and everything else? No, I don't, I don't think I don't think it is. I, I think you know the the most important thing about um, a great advertising uh, campaign is that it is um, communicating the message that you wanted to communicate. Um, the second thing is that it's getting in front of the right people. And the third thing is that it tells people what you want them to do. So you've got number one, um, that it is the right message, because without that, the other two fall down. So it's kind of like a triangle or a something House of Cards is what I'm going for, but mm -hmm. if you take one of the pieces away, then the other two definitely crumble. And what I've noticed is if we sometimes have customers come to us saying, these adverts aren't working or Facebook isn't working or Google isn't working, or and we can usually drill down and say, ah, this advert does not have uh, a message that uh, communicates what you're actually trying to do well, or this advert is being targeted at people who don't care about what you want to sell them or what you want to do with them. Or you've got those two things right, but you've forgotten to say, click here now or buy this now or, or something like that. Yeah, so what is if any of those three things are missing, and no matter how much time you've spent on each of the other ones, it, it will break and it will, it will crumble. 
and whenever I say it like that, hopefully it comes across pretty simply because I think that's a really easy formula to go with to think, you know, does this have the right message? Is it going to the right people? And uh, is it telling them where to go and, and what to do? One of the things I do when I'm reading letters from other accountants or solicitors or mortgage brokers or something, I pick up, pick up words and phrases and then I go, ah, wow, that was a good way of saying that. Or that was, that was an interesting way of explaining that particular thing. Or um, that, that, that's a useful thing to put into the engagement letter. And I learn from what my compatriots, is that, is that the right word? People in my, my industry are doing. Are you yeah. sitting watching TV every night just looking at the ads going, wow, that's, that's a cool ad? Or no, 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 stop. Are you completely sick of advertising by the time the day ends and you, you just don't care or think about it? No, I, I, I love it. I, I think that comes down to really enjoying what you do. I, I love a terrible ad. I love a, a mediocre ad. I love a great ad. Whenever, you know, if we see a really great ad, we'll, I'll snap it on the TV and I'll send it around to the team using one of our uh -huh. technologies. The team did the same thing. We say, look, this is a cool, cool advert. And What's the coolest ad you've seen recently? The coolest... The cool, yeah, no, the, the coolest ad I think I have seen um, recently isn't necessarily about the advert. It's when I was in um, New York City um, and in Times Square, and when I was in uh, the Philippines, in Manila, and in um, Thailand, what I noticed was in the big cities, there was huge screens everywhere with adverts on them. So if you think New York City, Times Square, it never gets dark because there's just all these adverts on screens everywhere. And I don't know if that's a good or good or a bad thing. Um, but what I saw recently in Belfast on the York Gate Exchange um, area, there was a, a, a screen. And I know there was one in Shaftesbury Square years ago, but it's not, it's not the same. This one is a proper digital screen where it's just placed right in the middle of a, a junction of where lots and lots of people are. Mm -hmm. And the reason why it's a, a really good advert and the reason why it's a really good platform is because it, it sticks out as something new because nobody's doing that really here yet and they're not doing it really well. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to look at it whenever you're stopped in front of it at the, at the traffic lights. It's better than a billboard because it's constantly moving over. It's not as good necessarily as a Facebook advert, but it's, you know, it's maybe not as relevant as a Facebook advert but it's interesting and it catches your eye. So any advert that'll catch your eye and any advert that'll you know, stop you and any advert that you can remember you know, is, uh, is definitely a good advert to me. Very good. I'm sitting at the moment trying to think of the last advert that I've seen that actually made me buy something that I, I watched the advert and went, I'm gonna go and get one of those. <laughs> Probably McDonald's <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> Can you think of one, an, an, an advert that's actually made, made you go and buy something or at least put it up? Something that you in your house or your world or your life. The Levi adverts, the guy with the boxer shorts, everybody right. bought jeans after that. Can you think of one like that that's recent that you thought that's made me buy those? I, I can tell you what I came close to. There's a, there's a platform called Wish out there and I don't know if you've heard of it it's like a place where you can get things for really cheaply online and they target the target it's like a AliExpress where things come from offshore and you can get them for really cheap but you have to wait for maybe four weeks until they come and they do have a really good advertising whenever you're scrolling they just put these interesting items things that you wouldn't really think about yeah. um in the carousel on Facebook so you're scrolling across it and they do about 30 items so you can sit in window shop just on your phone looking through it so i saw a couple of interesting items and it seems to be always like camping gear but i saw um one for a kayak and i was flicking through so i clicked on the kayak i got through to the kayak on the wish wish store and i had a i had a serious conversation with myself about whether or not i was going to purchase uh, a kayak or not and i had to just hold myself back and go you don't need a, a kayak you're in advertising you've literally maybe been on a kayak once in your, in your life and uh -huh. you, you don't need it. So you should be immune to this kind of um, influence online, but it probably shows just how, you know, even someone like myself who's working in adverts all day, every day can be sucked in down that rabbit hole and, and end up nearly buying a, a kayak. 
And Facebook advertising seems to be a very powerful thing. I'm, I'm going to go off this straight. This is just, you've got me fascinated with this now. It, it's, it's, you're such, you have, you've got like the most interesting job in the world to me. I, I am completely fascinated by this. Facebook adverts. I don't even see them anymore. They're, they're literally, they're on the side of the page and I'm like blind to them for some reason. It's like a ticking clock in a room. It's, if, if they talk, you'll hear it at the start and then after a while you'll not even hear it anymore. And I feel that that's what's actually happened to me with Facebook ads. I can't, I can't remember actually having seen a Facebook ad that caught my attention in a long, long time. And uh, is there something going on there that I'm not aware of? Does, does Facebook use subconscious or something really, really clever that if I'm not seeing the ads, I, I'm, I'm really being manipulated in some way? Or is it, am I overthinking this? It's not really that smart. No, it's it's not it's not that smart. It's it's your brain is smarter, I think, than you know uh, any algorithm that Facebook can create right now. So, Facebook want you to see the ads. There's no doubt about that. So they want you to see the adverts and, and look at them. But if you think about what happened with TV adverts when when they died, was when the plus thirty generation came in of the sky boxes where you could uh, record something and then fast forward through the through the adverts. So on, on Facebook now, because you've been that annoyed by adverts, I always tell customers, no one has ever, ever, ever went on Facebook to see your advert. Nobody cares about your advert. It, it's your <laughs> job to, to get it in front of people, whether it's on Facebook or wherever it is. Um, and because Facebook has been saturated and flooded with adverts over time, it means that you're blind to it. You're scrolling straight past them. You're doing everything you can not to um, interact with it. So Facebook right now is going the way of the uh, newspaper adverts um, whenever Facebook uh, came along. So you have to be smarter, you have to have a more appealing advert, you have to be a little bit faster. And it comes back to what we were saying before about how do you keep up with what's coming coming next? Because th the second that our, our mothers and our grandmothers started to go on Facebook, it started to become uncool and unpopular. And, and now we need to look to the TikToks and we need to look to the next things that are out there uh -huh. to um, see what's gonna be valuable. Now, look back though with Twitter. Twitter is seeing a massive resurgence now in its pop popularity. So it's right. not as if platforms can't go up and down. For, for sure, um, Twitter is now becoming the place to, to see real-time information. I mean, whenever there was a couple of, I think it was RAF typhoon jets going over East Belfast, I heard them. I immediately went on Twitter to see if anybody was talking about them, to see if it's what they, what they were. And sure enough, I was able to get that information in, in real time. So wow. the in, internet networks that we have now are just figuring themselves out. They're really young. They're really like 10 years old. They're not, they're not that old. They're not, they're not as old as other platforms. So um, they've got time to figure that out. So with that in mind, that people are now sort of blinkered to adverts and they've got like advert radar and they're sort of like, are able to steer away from it almost subconsciously. How important is the idea of personal brand, of building your own brand as a small business person built around who you are and what you're like and that type of stuff? How, is, is personal brand really as important as people let on it is? Yeah, I, I think I think it definitely I think, I think it definitely is. It's it's really important to understand what your customers want and to understand what you're really good at and try to put those two together and to be a good uh, shameless promoter of yourself in that pursuit um, because you may as well um, you may as well be as good as you can be in front of your customers and you may as well you know have a little bit of probable self-awareness of how you're coming across and the optics of what you're doing is probably important and I Definitely don't claim to be any expert of, of that at all, but I can see other people, you know, that do it really well. And I, and I think, yes, those, those are the people that are, you know, able to, the doors open for them a lot easier whenever they're a little bit self-aware of their own personal and brand. who are they? You know, you've got, you've got some really cool, um, I, I would say, Martin, in all honesty, and it's probably a little bit sycophantic, but I would say you are very um, good at that. Whether you, That's the only reason I asked. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the truth because I, I think um you know 
if you're genuine and you come across as genuine and you seek out opportunities to get in front and interact with people and you're searching for you know uh, what's best for people in order to advance you know what we're doing and for us all to do well together i think that comes across as very genuine and it's a good thing um so any anybody that does that and, and does it um consistently in front of people it, it's a good thing and that's a big part of personal branding i think for me personally very good i'm trying to think who i think who's doing it at the moment i think very well i see henry mccrory from creative three does a lot of stuff with pictures <laughs> and there's like a whole series of pictures and he shares them all at once with with text and stuff in it it reminds you of them his his business partner christopher um, is yeah, doing this. those guys do a really good job they, they put a lot of thought into what they do and i think that's quite important mm -hmm. you know whenever you're um getting yourself out there I, what i love about what christopher's doing is he, he's doing this thing during lockdown where he's um, using the Facebook, I don't even know what the tool's called. I know I use it all the time. It's one of the ones you can select on it. It basically, I, I, don't, I, don't, I forget what it's called, but basically he's, he's telling the story of what he does at home. And he's shown us, some, us cooking and painting rooms inside the house and painting rooms outside the house and going for walks yes. on the beach. Uh -huh. And he's, he's a fantastic chef. Like he, he really yeah. cooks some brilliant food. He, he, he talks about his um, cutting the grass and how he keeps it green and like all the wee jobs he's doing around the house, he's filming and putting it off. I don't watch every single one, you know, and I, I don't watch any of them the whole way through. But I see bits of it and it, it just catches my attention for maybe a minute or two while I while I watch it. I, th I think he's doing it and he's whatever, he, he obviously is a professional because the shots are always really well formed. Like his house looks fantastic. It's like a show house. And he always looks well, and the food always looks good. So I think if, if, if I was to pick out people that are doing that stuff, Henry and Chris would be doing stuff really well. Um, we all know Gavin Wall. You know, Gavin Wall on LinkedIn, I'm, I'm saying that like it's just a shouldn't. You know who Gavin Wall is? Sure, yeah. Yes, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Um, he, he, he did great stuff on, on, on LinkedIn for a while and, and was very vulnerable, I think is a word that has to be used. Like he was honest about the good stuff and he was also honest about the, 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 the other, maybe not so good issues that came out of that. Um, and another person who really interests me is Matthew Thompson from Best of Belfast. Yeah. Now, he made the purposeful decision to go completely off social media. I think he's sure. still off social media. But his job, his business is a media business. It's interviewing people. And he decided he wasn't going to be on Facebook, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Because what he said was he wanted to crystallize or create a really quality environment where the people who were listening were people that were bought into, I don't know, the ethos or, or the brand or whatever it was that he was trying to do. Um, they're, 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 I suppose those are just the, the people that I'm seeing regularly coming through my feed. Is it, are there people like that that I'm missing that I should be looking out for? I, I, don't, I don't think so. I, I think, you know, we all actually have very different feeds. You know, yes. There's a different, there's, we, we kind of, there's an echo chamber and a, a filter bubble where you know, I will see different people that than than what you will you will yes. see, and I, I think that's why conversations like this are really important, mm -hmm. um, and and the ones that we we have and the ones that I have with have, have had recently with with other people. You know, the mutual friend of James James Perry, and you know other people like Shane McCann and people like that. Those, you know, you get to connect up with people like that, and then you see other people as well. Um, and it widens out. It's a healthy thing where it widens out your experiences of what information you're taking in at times. Fascinating. I, that's, I, I love that idea of echo chambers or, you know, social bubbles. And you're trapped inside this universal world where you see the same places all the time. And you sort of wonder, are they the only people that are doing this in Belfast or Northern Ireland? And of course they're not. Of course there's not only yeah. 50 people that are genuinely engaged in activity and business but yeah. people just do it in different ways in different environments mm -hmm. and we're not we're just not seeing each other you know i i don't really see 
I used to have I used to be down in City East and the the foundry more in previous times, but for whatever reason, and I don't tend to be in there anymore. I used to spend a lot of time down in Farset Labs and and be involved in the community down there. But my, my situation changed and I just can't be there anymore. So I'm not seeing what's happening in those those environments. And you forget yeah. that. You forget that it's so important to have conversations like this, to reach out to people that aren't in your normal work life environment. Otherwise you tend to lose out on opportunities to learn and to experience stuff and to, to have those conversations. No, great point. Um, just to change the subject completely, away from technology and back to something that's been about for thousands of years. Maybe not, maybe not thousands. Books. Well, yeah. what's, the most, what's the most important books you've read and why? You know, there's so many. I kind of tend to read audio audiobooks um, a lot. And I, I read a lot of business books. And there's some that are really, really great. There's one that I read, though, that just it just sticks out for me and it's by a chap called Adam Smith and it's called the wealth of nations. And now that I think about it, you know, I've actually never properly read the book through because it's about this thick and it's yeah. you know, tiny, tiny writing. And it's kind of like, it's really, it's, there's a lot, a lot of words in it. And it's kind of oldie English. It's like reading the Bible. Yeah. So I'm not sure I'm focused enough for, for, for that. But the reason why I really like it is because um, I was in Edinburgh and I was doing a walking tour and I was told that there's this little graveyard at the side and I just caught it at the corner of me that there are um, flowers on one of the graves in the graveyard uh, and I thought that graveyard looks really, that kirkyard looks really, really old. I don't, I don't know why it's, why would any, how would anybody be that, you know, loved or famous that, you know, maybe hundreds and hundreds of years past there would be still people putting, you know, flowers on their graves. So I looked in and I saw it was an Adam Smith and I thought, I'm going to look this guy up. And then I started seeing his statue in places in Edinburgh and it was really cool. So I looked up the story and I learned so much from little snippets of the book and things like that about, you know, global trade, global commerce, how there's like a, you know, a hidden trickle whenever you spend a little bit of money in a bakery that that money has gone back so many different times to people that are making the flour, making the bread and making the packaging. Um, speeding people that are able to then do the labor that, that feeds it and everything is kind of cyclical. Um, it's a very beautiful concept where, you know, what you're doing matters, your labor matters, doing something good matters, doing hard work matters and putting real effort into it uh, can matter and you can make real change and do really amazing things. Um, and it doesn't just happen you know, that you do something and nobody cares. You don't know the effects and you don't know the limits of what your potential is. And that's mm -hmm. what I took from that book. Even though I haven't really properly properly read it, that, that's what I took from the little snippets that I, that I had. And I'm not surprised now that people are still going to that grave in Edinburgh and leaving flowers in the pouring rain. Um, and since then I've traveled different places that have uh, statues of Adam Smith. It's been really random because I've just arrived there, I've ended up there and ended up being confronted with a, a statue of, of Adam Smith or being in the bookshop and seeing the book book there. So that book has put a big impact on me and I think the world. And I would recommend anybody to just look up about, you know, Adam Smith and, and what, he, what he did. But um, I think it also just says that there's a lot of value in, you know, reading and looking out there and finding different different things. But what about you, Martin? What's your, what's your um, greatest book read? I would never read... <laughs> a book like that honestly i it's not that it doesn't have incredible value like i, I have bookshelves full of big hefty tomes about accountancy and business and leadership and, and all that type of stuff and i've never read any of them the whole way through basically i've read them to pass the exam i pass the exam i put them back on the shelf and moved on and the more exams you pass the more the less you have to read because you realize how exam systems work and it's it's not really about it's not about wisdom, it's about knowledge, and those two are different things. So I do appreciate that the importance of reading and, um, and, and building knowledge, but I, I tend to get most of my knowledge from conversations or from snippets that other right. people have shared. I, yeah. I let other people curate for me what, what's important. So I see stuff, if somebody's just posting rubbish all, all the time and I notice it two or three times, I'll just, hide them from my feet. I'm not, I'm not unfriend them, but you know, I'll, I'll just hide their comments and stuff from my feet because it's not happening. 
Where if somebody's coming along and they're sharing great events or they're making great comments, or even they're just amusing, you know, they're funny without being aggressive or rude or, you know, um, all the stuff you shouldn't be in humor. You, 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 there's, there's good humor. If, if, if they've got good humor, um, if they're inspirational, if they are engaging, interesting, well-informed, I, I would follow other accountants. There's, there's a, there's a um, Claire Stewart from Cartmel Stewart Slizzler, or um, Chartered Accountants. Yeah, I see her content on LinkedIn. It's fantastic. She, she produces some really good, well-thought-out stuff. Now, the fact is, I probably know the stuff that she's producing anyway, but what she's doing is she's produced it in such a way that it's valuable when it's shared. And sometimes I look at stuff like that and I go, should I be doing that? Should I be taking the time to analyze, break down, classify, clarify, and explain stuff in a way that's really well thought through, well produced, and looks good in the way that Claire does? And then I realize I don't have to. Claire's done it. Does it, yeah. <laughs> my, 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 my job's different. I, I know Claire, I think we're friends. And I, I, I've shared her stuff before, and I believe she's happy for me to share it. If she's doing that great work and she's building a reputation in her practice and it's, 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 it's heightening her credibility and her um, authenticity and, and the, the, the visibility, that personal brand that Claire has, do you know, that's absolutely fantastic. And if I tried to do it, I probably wouldn't do it as well as what she does. So what I do is I take the information that I glean from all these different areas, you know, plug in the main, and I share them in a different sort of way. So I'll share them in conversations such as this. It'll not be that I start off the conversation thinking that tonight I'm going to share this, 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 and this, and it's all going to go out, and everybody's going to know that I get that. What's more important to me is during the course of the conversation that if a topic comes up and if I know something on it, that I'll share it then because it's just so easy. Mm. And for me, gaining wisdom, gaining knowledge is important. Knowledge is the foundation of wisdom. But gaining wisdom is even more important. The, the, taking knowledge and using it in, a, in an appropriate and, and wise <laughs> <laughs> wise way is, is, is yeah. just as important as the knowledge itself and the way to gain and share wisdom is through conversation and that's essentially where I get most of my knowledge from. Now saying that as, char as a chartered accountancy practice we have to do our CPD there's continuing professional development um, and we must maintain our that record over, over the number of years and things will come up. Legislation will change, making tax digital will come in, new pieces of software will come out. Um, the, the most recent big changes our environment are all the support packages that have come out in relation to um, and the COVID crisis. And it's my job and our job here at Gilchrist & Co to know that stuff. And that does mean sitting down and taking out the, the publications that are shared by County Web or Invest NI or HMRC, reading the nitty-gritty nitty and learning the details. So it's not that we don't do that. It's just when I'm, generally speaking, I try not to read big, heavy books and more sort of a, a pick stuff up as you go along type of guy. Yeah, of course, of course. So uh, if I was, to, this, this is, so on the basis of that, I love it when somebody else reads a big book and then I can come along to them and say, what's it about? You know, what, <laughs> what's the important bit? If you could say in a sentence or two or three sentences, what's the most important thing that you picked up from Adam Smith? And for, uh, even more, before you answer that, another question popped into my mind. Um, it was a conversation I was having with my wife, Michelle, the principal yes. at Gilchrist and Co. recently. And the boss. We're, the boss, exactly. Everybody was just the boss. There's no point in me pretending <laughs> to be anything else. And we had been in Newcastle for a stroll along the promenade, self-distancing, you know, all the safety features and stuff you're supposed to do. And when we were driving home from Newcastle, and I was thinking about the value of money, the value of a fiver. So you take a five pound note, and the value's not in the paper. The value is derived from somewhere. So maybe I got that fiver because one of our clients 
valued whatever I did to the amount of a fiver. So they said, right, okay, that's worth a fiver. I'm giving you my fiver. But they had to be that valuable to someone before them. So somebody else had to go to them and say, well, you're worth a fiver. There's a fiver to you. Now, obviously, it might have been a thousand pound or it might have been ten pound or whatever. Yeah. But somehow, of the value worth a fiver had to be passed along. But my question is, how was that, if it always has to come from somewhere, where does the initial five pound of value get created to be passed on? It, it, it's, it is uh, fascinating. Where is, what's the chicken and the, chicken and the egg? Um, yeah. can, can they, where, where does it, where does it start? Where does it, I, I think that that links into what, what you're asking about. What did I get from Yes, you exactly. That's the point I'm getting. I think it, I think it links in. It's completely connected. Those two things, and and I think that, do you know, it's a, it's something that my dad said uh, a couple of days ago. Whenever we were talking about the business and we we're saying it's getting a little bit bigger and it's going going okay, it's going it's going all right. And um, uh, he's obviously always concerned and sort of all they're thinking, well, what what are you doing? What are you doing here? What is what? What, or do you not think you should stay small or, or that just because they want to make sure, you know, um, okay. they're very happy for me to be really big in that, but um, they want to, they want to stay small. But what, what he, um, what he said was, um, I'm really impressed that you've been able to do this out of nothing, out of completely nothing. I'm really, it's really impressive that you've been yeah. able to do this out of, out of nothing. And I was, he, he was a driving, he's a, he is a driving instructor. And, and he was able to build his business out of nothing, out of absolutely, out of absolutely nothing. So if I bring it back to the book and bring it back to Adam Smith and the Wealth of Nations, remember I haven't even read this book, so I probably no right to even be talking about it. But I, I got, I get, I get the the snippets from it because I couldn't read a book because it couldn't read that book because it's too big. You can do something with very, very little. You can do something with just yourself. You can create some level of of value. You can um, wash cars. You can, um, if you can't wash cars because you're not physically able to wash cars, you can write a blog post on your um, internet and you can sell that blog post to someone who wants it. You're, if you're um, not able to write the blog post and you're, um, you don't have any hands or something like that, um, you can speak to an article or do a, a podcast like, like this. Human beings have this incredible, unfathomable, um, unmeasurable uh, uh, power that a allows us to create things that no other species on the planet can create. And it's amazing. And that's where that value comes from. That's where that moment of this is worth some money to someone. I want to buy it. Starts off with that fiber. It turns into tenor. It turns to, and goes round and round and round and round and round. The wealth is not in the fiber. It's not in the business. It's not in the thing that you sell. It it's in the ability and the potential of what you can create and what you can do which means that you should try stuff and you should try and go and do stuff and see what happens because yeah. you never know where it's going to end up. You never know what's going to happen. Fantastic. That is a fantastic answer to a question I didn't even and shouldn't have even have lumbered you with. I, I will use that answer. If somebody ever asks me in the future, where is the value of a fiver? Where does that come from? I will quote Mr. Peter Doak. Um, um, maybe, maybe word for word. Maybe word for word. Okay, we we'll have to we we'll have to start drawing this towards an, towards an end. I, I could speak to you all night. The difficulty is a very enjoyable evening. Yeah, but the, the problem is, if I spoke to you all night, it would be entirely selfish, <laughs> and nobody else would watch past the first. What is it? Three minutes that people usually pay attention for. If it is you know, we've, lost, we've lost everybody at this stage. At this stage, <laughs> <laughs> this is just completely for us. This, this part's just for us. <laughs> for us. Here, what do you say? I'm going to do this. See if there's anybody else still listening at this stage of the video. Thank you very much. I really, yeah, really. <laughs> if you, if you, I'm sorry for you as well. <laughs> yeah. Send me a message and let me know that you've actually listened, and, and, and you'll be my best friend. There could be a special prize in it for you if you if, if you've actually watched the this stage. You want Peter? You, I, I imagine a lot of people watch this stage. This, this stuff you've been going over has been absolutely brilliant. I'm going to ask you one final question. Sure. And you know what? We can all look back when we were younger people and say, yeah, if I'd done that then, I wouldn't be so chubby now. Or if I'd sort of like done more push-ups, 
two years ago, maybe have a bigger shoulders, not, whatever it is, you know, I wish I'd put oil in my car before the engine sees, whatever that is. If you were, imagine yourself in five years time from now, what would you be in five years time here? I will be, um, I'm 34 now. What does that make me in five years? 39? 39. 39. Yeah. Still a young man. <laughs> on on the on the verge of your prime. I think I think the prime starts the about forty. Right. Yeah, yeah. So so you're you'll be on the verge of your prime in about five years' time. And you look back at yourself and you say, and you could advise you come back on a time machine. Oh <laughs> yeah. why are you? <laughs> you should have bloody worked hard. Whatever it is. Yeah. What what um what advice would the Peter Doak, and this this is this is a crazy question, but what advice would the Peter Doak five years in the future give you now? Do you think? Not what advice would you give someone the Peter Doak from five years before now? You're not looking at your past self and advising your past self. This is yeah. your future self advising yeah. you now what to do. What what what, what would it say? Yeah. Well, it would definitely start with put down that Hagen Dazs ice cream. That would be with the, that would be, that would be the number one thing. It would be get get your get yourself off to that to that gym, do a bit more um, running. No, it it would be um, uh, trust trust yourself. Um, you know, make make sure that you 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 got to here for a reason. You survived you survived a lot of stuff um you know for a reason you you were able to get through a bunch of stuff your business got through a bunch of stuff um you got through loads of jobs and you get through loads of loads of things and you've built up a level of knowledge that you don't even know that you have and it arrives every time you need it whenever you need it so trust that instinct and you know um don't second guess yourself quite as quite as much um do things with a little bit more more uh more trust in yourself trust yourself Good advice that anybody can give themselves. So I, I on that note, I think we will finish. To anybody that's um, Martin, I'm sorry, just oh. just I just really want to thank you so much for the opportunity. To talk with you. It's wonderful that we get that opportunity to to talk together on this, and it's been a really amazing experience for for me. So um, thanks, thanks so much again. You want, you're very welcome, Peter. And to be honest, the reason I do it is, is I enjoy it. It gives me a fantastic excuse to talk to really people that I find genuinely interesting and engaging and people that I really want to speak to. And you know, if you just rung somebody up uh, that out of the blue and said, I, I want to have an hour's conversation with you or I get to ask you loads of questions. <laughs> well, what for? Oh, I just don't know. <laughs> you might not get to have that. So to actually get the opportunity to sit down and do a recording, to, to share it with um, people, my friends, and people who are interested in what I'm doing. And I think the most important thing at all, Peter, the real, the really great thing for me from this point of view is, from, from the point of view of doing this, is that a lot of credibility comes from the people that you're associated with. And for people, for you to say, do you want know actually, I will go on and have a chat with Martin for 40 minutes or half an hour, whatever, whatever it may be, and, and go through the questions and answer them honestly and authentically and, and with real thought you want know, that, that's a privilege for, for me so thank you thank you very much peter um and yes we'll, we'll, we'll finish that point just before i close off anybody that has watched this um i hope you've enjoyed it i hope you've enjoyed it as much as i have it, uh, believe you me these things are much more enjoyable when you're doing it yourself <laughs> if, if, you, if, you, if there are people on the video you'd really enjoy it and if you want to experience that, if, you, if you'd like to come forward with me and have one of these conversations at any stage in the future, please do get in touch because um, I, I really want to talk to you. I want to see your perspective on, on the bottle. I can only see this. You can see that side and I can see this side. Let's, let's get each other's perspective on these things. Come on, have a chat and, and let my friends see who it is that's, uh, that I'm engaging with on a daily basis. Peter, on that note, I'm going to finish the recording now. Don't go away. We will we will chat after this. But to everybody else, cheerio.